Everyone, this is three questions with David Jakes, Chicago Bears fan. Go Bears. <laughs> right. <laughs> Goals. Yeah, it actually, David Jakes and I have known each other for a long time. You're actually probably like one of the first people I ever followed on Twitter. Do you know that? I didn't know that. You're an OG, man. Like, I remember following you a long time ago. And, and then, plus, you like the Bears, so I even got this off. Oh, <laughs> there you go, so. So I'm like, I'm really excited to have you on the podcast. And for those of you who don't know, David actually has a brand new book out. And we're going to get in three questions in a second. And it's called Design Thinking to Reimagine the Role and Practice of Educators. And you can see it right there. And David, you, here's what else you get. Just because you did a little, we get the little <laughs> so shout out Horror for publishing a book, right? And I actually right, remember, I actually remember you and I years ago, we were in an airport. And you were going Gosh. one place and I was going to another place. And I remember talking to you and I just said to you, I love you how you write. And D David is lit. He actually takes one of the things I really appreciate about your writing. And I'm not the brightest guy. You take really complex things and you make them so easily, like t it's so easy to understand, which is what I really appreciate. And I'm like, oh, I don't feel so dumb <laughs> stuff. Cause well, thank you, George. No, that, that is one, that is such a gift, I feel, and I really appreciate the way you write. So we're going to talk more about the book in the second podcast, but for those of you who are listening to this one, can you just give a brief synopsis? What is the book about? The book is about a new role for educators, a designer, and I think the interesting thing is that all teachers are designers, design lessons, and they have background in that. And so what I'm doing is playing off that and building that out to a different degree in adding skills and capacities to expand the role of design and how it impacts the classroom experience. The book uses and makes a case for design thinking as a pedagogical approach. Yeah. And I, for a long time, I've been interested in design and how that plays out, how that can play out in schools. There's a there's an opportunity to reimagine what happens in classrooms. And the book is literally about that. I'm proud that the book, the book itself is, I mean, it opens with introduction to design thinking, explains the process. There's a couple chapters on foundation and philosophy and describing what a design thinking classroom might look like. And then the majority of the rest of the book is all practitioner based and focused on the strategies and techniques for, for doing this. So it's a pretty comprehensive a treatment of the process and how it might impact the classroom experience. And that's actually one of the things I think you do so well and is actually like Something that bugs me a little bit in education is that we'll say design thinking, but people just say it, but they don't really like articulate what it is, what it actually means. And we do this with so many words. Like I, I actually think buzzwords are created when we just throw them around with actually digging out to what they mean. That's when they become buzzwords, right? Like people just say things. I'm like, what do you even mean by that? And then they can't articulate. And I think you do such a great job. And that's what I'm really excited about with this. Yeah, I would agree with you. When you look at, you can, for example, you can do a Google search on design thinking and look at an image search and you'll have, gosh, the process is represented so many different ways. Right. And in some way that's good because you can make it your own and the book makes a case for that, making mm -hmm. the process of design your own. But it has become a buzzword. It started in business and it's trickled down in education. And the last thing that we want this to do and take this extremely powerful process that's so that can be used to create such rich experiences for kids and turn it into one of the next thing that disappears right. in a couple of years. It's uh, there is an opportunity here. It's and really to build out the skills and dispositions that kids need to be successful in a world that's completely unpredictable right now. Love that. I love that. And if that's probably the best thing we can teach kids is like how to actually adapt to, we don't know what's next, but with teaching kids how to adapt to it is the most important thing. So I love it. So Anyone who's interested in the book, check it out. It's actually in this description down below. And David, you've actually had a ton of experience. You actually have um, a design thinking background that you've been working on for several years, but you also have been an educator for 27 years. You taught biology and anything was taught. As soon as I know it, that's why I'm like, that's why this guy makes me always, I know he's so smart because I was the worst science student ever. So <laughs> you pull that off of me. And, and he did admin, instructional technology. So I know you have a ton of experience in education, but when you look back on your experience, not only as a teacher, but as a student, who is a teacher that really inspired you and why? I think it's interesting. I didn't have a very good high school experience. And I think I, it's an interesting question because the, probably the most formative experiences I had was, were in college. And I can think of three professors that they're actually mentioned in the book, Dr. David Rohn, Dr. Jack Heaton, and Dr. Bill LeGrand, all at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point, where I got my 
undergrad. And I think when I look back on their role, the first thing is they really challenged me to think and become a critical thinker. And those four years were extremely formative in a lot of ways, but those three individuals taught, they really pushed me to grow intellectually and how I really approach the world. And if I could say, sum it up in one particular statement, I think they, the three of them, they all had different techniques and I remember them all finally. They, the standards that they held me to were things that I didn't think I could achieve. And it was one of those situations where, you know, as a student, you realize all of a sudden that you had this opportunity and that these people expect more from you and you want to rise to their level of expectation. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what the three of them did. Dr. Rohn was, he actually taught, I took him for a class in the JFK assassination of all things. And it was amazing to listen to him in this passion for the topic. He's a expert on it. And he had things like, he had us go back and look at the original Warren report and go through original data and process all that. So it was this actually this, incredible foundation of being intellectually challenged and rising to meet the moment. But most importantly, it has helped me to find my place in the world, I think. And the three of them shaped that greatly. And I'm internally indebted to their role in my life and their capabilities as educators. I love that. And actually, it's really, first of all, we're going to give them a little shout out. So that, a little shout out button for the impact there. But the, yeah. when, when I've read your writing and i think about this all the time like we we talk people talk about like how technology is ubiquitous and everywhere and stuff like that i actually feel it is so easy to use that it actually can lend itself to making us dumber i know that's a maybe a weird thing to say i when i was a kid and i know you very well we got an apple 2c and that computer to actually make it do stuff was very hard Right. So you actually had to know a lot of stuff, but now stuff is so easy that it can actually make us think less. And I always get a little worried about that. And one of the things I've always appreciated about your writing is just the perspective and sharing stuff so that you really challenge people to go deep into things, not just the like the glitz and glamour of what things look good, but don't actually have any depth to it. So you can obviously see that 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 influence those educators have had on you. So is that something that you see quite a bit, like that the shallow level kind of things, or as opposed to the depth? Is that something you focus on? It's, I started teaching in 1986. And we didn't even have copy machines at that time. There was no computers available to anyone really. The smartphone was just a dream of something that was a way off in the future. Internet, of course, was years away yet. When you think about technology, you have all, I remember getting the first laser disc with all access to all those images and the things that brought in there's when we look at the technology today, especially one-to-one programs, I, I constantly, when I was involved in the very first rollout, I, last time I worked in the school, you did the first rollout of the old gray Samsung Chromebooks. And you have to wonder if that's really realized its potential. And I'm going to lean into an answer and say, probably not in the sense that a lot of cases now they're, they are used for very superficial kind of applications, checking grades and doing things like that, checking for assignments and calendars and doing online worksheets. There's so much potential yet technology can bring. And when I look at technology, where we're at now in schools, where it can be, there's a big gap still. And the book makes a case for the principal role of technology being as a tool to connect learners to beyond, beyond the school and the experiences beyond the school that can bring. So there's still a lot of growth potential involved in technology. I'm particularly interested in technology as a generative tool, being able to use that as to create things. Are we still working on that? You still see people stepping into digital storytelling which is a good thing, but that's been around for 15, 20 years now. So the uptake on technology in schools has been a little bit slow. We could do a, have done a much better job on that. And the potential to interesting thing is we had this pandemic, obviously, and everybody went to remote learning. And so you have to wonder was, did that experience really influence the way people perceive the role of technology in schools, especially for teachers and kids, right? Whether or not that cast a pretty big shadow on technology because the last thing you want to do is learn on a machine for two years, right? And I think kids are a little tired of technology learning. online. So the question remains an open one in terms of the true impact of technology where technology can take us, but there are opportunities to, to really extend. I'm really interested in thinking about a larger ecology of learning spaces. And I think virtual, what we learned about virtual technologies and learning online is that they You miss out on all the things that are so important in education. For example, this, when you're talking, nobody knows this except you're a veteran educator. 
you can talk about something in your class and you can right away tell if kids get it or not by their body language, by their right. quizzical looks, by their questions. It doesn't require an assessment other than once an experienced teacher has a feel for that, you get it. Yeah. And so that's what was lost. You're staring into a screen and you miss all those human elements of that were so important in face-to-face -face classrooms. I often talk about, people ask me about classrooms and classroom classrooms have this traditional historical perspective. Everybody knows what the classroom is, but at the end of the day, it's still a functional unit and still a functional space where of schools where learning occurs. It's where kids that want to learn meet the committed adults that are going to help them do that. And that really is a timeless role of that space. We lost that for a while. And when we look forward in terms of down the road and what technology can bring, and there's lots of talk right now about uh, artificial intelligence, all that, and where that's going how that might impact education. But ultimately, at the end of the day, to create systems and technologies that are much more human in that in, involve a greater level of human engagement will be what, what brings technology forward, in my opinion. And we're going to, and we're, I'm going to ask you about artificial intelligence, but you're going to have to watch the other podcast to get your answer on this because I'm <laughs> right. really curious of what you think about this. And so I know that you have done a ton of work as a leader. And David, when I actually think about, I know that you are an administrator, but you are someone I've always looked up to as a leader in spaces. Like it shows that leadership is not a title, but just is who you are. And so I've always looked to you as a leader, someone that I has influenced a lot of my thinking. And one of the things I appreciate, and I think this is going to be what people are going to really like about the book. When I, when I judge a book that's really good, it's one that makes me like, go, oh, okay, I got to start thinking, like, I got to think different here. It doesn't reaffirm me. It actually challenges me in a way to do something different. And I think that's what I've always appreciated. And I think great leaders can do that in a way where you also don't think you're an idiot. Do you know what I mean? I think that to me is important because then you feel you have the opportunity to change, right? It's not you're doing something wrong, but is there a better way to think about stuff? So I know you've been leading for a long time. So when you think of your administrators in your past, the leaders that you've had, who's someone who's influenced you and why? Oh, that's a great question. That'll be a struggle to answer. I have, it, my immediate response to that, George, is that I don't think it's any one person. And let me give you a little background on my leadership. So I was doing a presentation one day for a professional development session, your typical school and service day. And the superintendent came and I gave the presentation and he came up, 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 up after me and he said, we've got this instructional technology position open. And this is after 15 years of teaching. And he goes, I'd love to see you apply for it. And I hadn't even given leadership or administration a thought. And so I'd applied for it and I actually got it. And so I, I had the challenge of actually becoming an administrator and then taking on that leadership role within a district that I was a teacher at. And that was a, that, that's a challenge. But going back to your question, I think I've drawn something from every administrator that I've worked with. I don't think it's any one person that had an overt influence on me. I think every person that I've worked with in leadership has taught me something. And coming out of the classroom into a leadership role was a big jump for me. And the, probably the biggest jump is it was for me was to see how the school operated and how decisions were made in a much glo more global scale. And with all the things that you had to consider and the impacts of your decision, and you're just not a classroom teacher and you're packing your 150 kids, which was my class at the time, but now you're impacting your decision to impact everybody. I learned from a lot of, I learned how to make decisions at a more global scale. I learned how to turn the other cheek, so to speak, when things weren't, but you get, sometimes you get criticized for the decisions that are made and you have to understand that and that that's all part of the job. It's interesting. My, I think my challenge in leadership was again to, was to extend the role of leadership. And what I mean by that is I think teachers can be great leaders. And I think every teacher can have a leadership role in a different way. And it's all scalable, right? And there's different levels of leadership. But I think when you're going back to getting to your question, I saw a lot of people that I, teachers that were leaders and I drew from them too. And just all the different experiences I had as a teacher helped me understand what it meant to be a leader. And that took a long time for me to shape. And along the way, I've met a lot of people that helped me do that. And it's not an easy road. There's a lot of challenges in leadership and it depends. I was fortunate to work in communities that were very supportive of education. And in my design role now, I see 
lots of challenges to leadership in a lot of different contexts, but it's not any one person. It's really my, my success is leadership as a result of a compilation of efforts from a lot of different people. Yeah. And I love that you mentioned that it's also teachers that you connected with too. And I always, I have that same belief that you can lead from any position that you're at and leadership yes. to me is the ability to move people forward in a positive manner. And it could be in so many different varied things and looking at that. So I love that you mentioned that because I've always believed this, that not every administrator is a leader, but, exactly. any, but any teacher can be a leader too, right? Like it's just, it's that ability to influence people to move forward in a positive direction. Yeah. And I would add to that by saying it's influencing people to move forward in a positive direction, but I think leadership in a lot of ways is taking people to places where they couldn't go alone Absolutely, and, and helping people make that jump and being supportive and saying, I'm here to extend your beliefs, your actions, the way in which you apply your craft. I think in a lot of ways, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a change in improvement is focused on risk-taking to some extent. And by nature, teachers aren't admittedly, and I aren't the best risk takers. And there's a lot of reasons for that. If you stood in front of 30, 15 year olds, you know what it means to take a risk. But where leadership comes in is being a strategic partner in that risk taking. And so shifting risk taking from an isolated event to one that's shared in that there's a strategic support system behind it is something that's interesting and something that, that makes schools better. Love that. So you have a ton of experience. And like you, you're very, you're like, I, you, I, you're a very wise man in my eyes. Like you're very wise, but there's no way that you knew all the stuff that you're talking about when you first started teaching. Right. And if you did, that'd be terrifying. <laughs> I would have been scared of you as a no clue. I had no clue. So if you can go back to your first year of teaching with all the stuff that you know, now all the experience you have, what advice would you give to your first year teacher self? Oh boy. That's a really interesting question. My background surprisingly, I don't know if you knew this is in aquatic biology. Uh, okay. Fisher, fisheries management. I have a master's degree in fisheries management. I always wanted to be <clears throat> a fisheries biologist. So I did that for a number of years in the Southeast uh, in Georgia and South Carolina, but then I came back up North. I missed the bears on Sunday. I came back up North and my, both my parents were teachers. And so they said, you should teach a trial teaching. So I went back and got my teaching certificate and I got my first interview. I got my job. I got my first job in I still remember walking into my classroom and my department chair said, here's your greenhouse. And I said, a greenhouse, you didn't mention this in the interview. And he goes, you're in charge of the school's greenhouse. So it's a big greenhouse too. And he goes, your point set is arriving on Wednesday. And I go, what's up? <laughs> so I spent 10 years leading, learning how to, in that situation, learning how to run a greenhouse. And it actually turned out to be something I really fell in love with doing. It was a great experience. There was no curriculum for the courses I taught, no class, no, no textbooks. I was in an old data classroom. So I think going back to thinking about giving advice to first yourself is to, it would be to continue to be fearless and to, to take, take teaching on as is something that when I think back to my experiences as an educator, I'm always reminded of this almost daily is I see my, the kids I had on Facebook and my, the kids that I had when I'm a first year teaching are in their fifties. If you can believe that, that's shocking, but you never know. I would remind myself and tell myself that you never know how you're going to impact a kid's life. And it can be from the smallest moment, the touch of a shoulder, the kind smile, the, just the comment to the student of how well they did on this particular assignment. You never know. It's always, every single kid has, comes into your classroom with challenges and they come from different home lines and they have different abilities, different levels of interest, different capacity to learn. You lose sight of that sometimes. And my advice to me would be to never lose sight of the individual strengths and challenges that kids bring to your classroom, to honor those, to respect those, and to really take those and say, I'm here to help you and help you on your next step. What I mentioned in the book and really the book, going back to that for a second, is really the fundamental essence of this is about launching the lives of children and young adults. And that's what schools and teachers can do. That's what they've always done. They've done so well for many years. There's a new world now. There's a new opportunity to do in different ways and more engaging ways, perhaps. But I think that's my advice to myself is never forget the power of the position in which you bring to the classroom experience, your tremendous role as a model for young people and what it can mean for their lives. I so appreciate that because I'm a big believer. If you see something good, you should always acknowledge it. And I think about going back to the beginning of the podcast when I saw you in that airport and I said, I really appreciate your writing. You like 
I remember you were like, I really appreciate that because we don't yeah. say stuff like that enough. And I was like, exactly. I, I'm so grateful that I actually had that opportunity to say it to you in person. Cause I, cause you, you, a lot of times I'll write something about stuff going on in my life, but I don't hear about anything until like, I see someone in person. I'm like, why didn't you say something? Like there's sometimes I just want to give up. Cause you, you don't mess people hold those good feelings. So I'm so grateful that you not only continued writing, but you wrote this book and I know it's going to help so many educators. For those of you listening, the design thinking classroom is now available. Check it out. It is absolutely amazing. <laughs> And David, I usually play an outro song, but I got a special one for you today. Oh, cool. There, there you go. go. You yeah. and I are probably the only people that know what this song is. is yeah, exactly. Right? Bear down, Chicago Bears. You're the pride and joy of Illinois. <laughs> so everyone have a wonderful day. David, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks, I look forward to people getting to read your book. Absolutely. Thank you.